I think it's a misnomer, and uh, Dorothy Sayers calls this out. The, it's a misnomer to call them the deadly sins because they're not. They're not really sins. They're not sins. Yeah, they're states of they're states of being. The, the, the well, Evagrius never called them sins. Right. He called them thoughts. That's right. And but the thing is, once one of these, uh, and and of course he called them demonic. So once one of these demonic forces takes you over, then you cannot do anything but engage in sinful behavior. And, and I think the reason Origen and Evagoras are so important is that it's not the Hebraic notion of sin as law, but it's more that notion of sin as separation from the self, separation from God, and separation from the community. And that's what these forces do, whether it's gluttony or envy. And just so you know, I mean, I remember when we studied it, envy in the classical sense, you probably know this, is not just about coveting, it is about, uh, it is about desire for the destruction of the other who has. Of the other, right. right. In the Islamic tradition, they actually, there's two Arabic words. So one of them is hasad, which is envy, where you want the destruction of the goods of the other. Or, or you want them to lose what they have, at least. If, if you envy their wife, you want them to, the, to have a divorce, right? Right, right. And, <laughs> uh, but the other word is ghipta, which it means joyful admiration. And so it's, it's, it's a positive envy. Like you actually do envy them. You wish you had what they had, but you would not want them to lose it. It's, it's a nice distinction. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, only two people should be envied, and he met this joyful admiration where you, you wish you had what they had, but, right. uh, and that was a, a man who was given wisdom and taught it, others that wisdom by day and night, and the other is a man who was given great wealth and used it to, 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 uh, for the common good and, and for helping the, the needy. And so he said those two people were worth having envy, this positive envy towards. All these people who write about anger also break it down, but the, what they all, they're all rooted in Aristotle. You have a burst, a momentary moment of anger, then you have resentment, and then you have wrath, which is the desire for vengeance. But, but Aquinas and all of those people are writing out of Aristotle. So, I mean, so is the Muslim tradition. You know, I think Aristotle had such an incredible impact on all of the Abrahamic uh, traditions and and they used them in different ways and then obviously uh, the uh, there, there's a Plotinus was actually translated into Arabic as the theology of Aristotle so Neoplatonism uh, came in the back door that way and and but you have you know it, with anger you have this understanding that uh, of the concupiscible and the irascible soul from Aristotle, which is adopted by both the Christian and, and I think all three. But, but uh, they understood that the irascible soul was a positive uh, force if it was guided by the rational soul. So they, they, they you know, Imam al-Ghazali says, you don't want to eliminate anger. You want to make it like a hunting dog where you release it at the proper time to the proper object uh, and, for, and for the right reason. So, so um, I think that's at the heart of, of, uh, of the spiritual practice of trying to tame uh, that, that irascible soul, which was placed in us to, go, to ward off evil and harm. Well, that's the, the distinction between righteous anger, right. which, which Aquinas, Gregory, you know, all of them except as part of a life of faith. Well, let me ask you something. <laughs> why, why, because I think, you know, you and I probably, I, I'm making this assumption, but just from, because I've read a, a lot of your uh, stuff. Um, and I think we both have a choleric temperaments um, and, and prob I'm sure you have, like I have worked over time to, to really, Ex exercise that temperament, uh, the negative aspects of it out. But it seems to me that we're living in a very choleric time. Like, why are people so angry? Well, because they're 
they're so constricted. I mean, uh, their, their life is stagnant. Uh, they don't see any hope for the future. Uh, they're under economic duress. Uh, you know that 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 that's. You know that I know when I when my first book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, after covering the war in El Salvador for five years, I end up in an airport in Costa Rica with my dog, and the guy behind the counter says, uh, "Well, uh, we don't have any crates. We can't put your dog on the plane." Uh, and your dog will have to sit in a crate in the airport for a week. Uh, and I flipped. I leapt over the counter. And I attacked. remember reading that story. It had nothing to do with my dog. It had to do with the accumulated rage and trauma that I'd spent five years undergoing. I mean, I had a, I used to have a nervous twitch. My eyes were, were, would go like this, you know, all the time. Yeah. So that's it, that, that people... You see it in prisons. I mean, uh, irony, I teach in prisons, and one of the ironies is that prisons are actually, as institutions, incredibly polite. If you bump, you never touch anyone in a prison, but if you were to bump into somebody in the hall, you're profusely apologetic. Um, and if you're not, it's a fight. Right. Um, because you're, everything is so bottled up and contained. And that's one. And number two, is that people who become consumed by wrath, and this is Emile Durkheim, they, uh, they seek the annihilation of others. But as Durkheim points out, it is driven by desires for self-annihilation. So that's that great quote by Evagrius of Pontus, uh, where he says the demons arm themselves with evil actions, once armed, they treat harshly those who arm them. Um, that you become, by any of these uh, seven deadly sins, seven deadly thoughts, it is about having the demonic seize control. Um, and then, you know, the, it controls you, you don't control it. Uh, and of course, the danger of wrath and vengeance is that the object, you internalize that, if it's a person, let's say, that object or that figure uh, essentially takes over, becomes part of your own identity. And I think that that notion of the demonic, you know, because demons, at least in, in biblical literature, is often seen as, as you know, actual physical entities, right. loses the wisdom yeah. of the fact that the demonic is real, that right. people can be seized by avarice, right. by by envy, by gluttony, by wrath. Um, and I loved, actually, you know, because with Evagrius of Pontus, he had eight thoughts. And then they it was later all reconfigured by Gregory. But they erased um, um, sadness. Melancholia. Yeah, but, that's, but, but for Evagrius, that was self-pity. Um, and that, you know, self-pity, pride led to wrath. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I would say, you know, in homeopathy, you have what, what they call a causa occasionalis, you know, the triggering events. So, like, if, if you get dust, somebody has an asthmatic attack, but it's not the dust, really. It's, it's, it's the susceptibility because there's an underlying uh, weakness in the immune system. And it seems to me that I think there's a lot more going on, like, I appreciate the, uh, the analysis and I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I still think there cause a cause analysis for, for the anger of modern society. I think there's deeper, I think, you know, in some ways, people have more today, even poor people than, I mean, I lived in West Africa and you've been to some of the poorest countries in the world. And, you know, in, where I lived in West Africa, they had over 50% um, unemployment. And yet, I was just amazed at how joyful the people were generally. Um, this was in, in Mauritania. And I think people are, they're angry because they've been deprived of so much. There has to be some sense of entitlement to, to get angry. You're getting angry because you feel like, I've been deprived of something. Like somebody cuts the line, they're taking time that should be yours and they're forcing you to wait longer. Uh, 
And so some people will just say, you know, what a jerk or, and just let it go. But other people will, will really go into a state of, uh, of, uh, of anger. And sometimes it'll lead to even uh, death. Yeah, I would say you're right. I, except I would, I would go back to Durkheim when he talks about anime and social bonds, that there are many social bonds that integrate us into the society work being highly important. And John Paul II, not a pope I loved particularly, but he did write a very fine encyclical on work. Um, and he understood the, he actually said that in order to sustain the family, one needs meaningful work with a living wage. He actually talks about the loss of uh, of work as one of the contributors to the breakdown of the family, and I think this is true. So there are many, many social bonds. I mean, I, I, I would agree with you, um, uh, but, there, but when all of these social bonds become ruptured, uh, when, when you have no place within the society to actualize yourself in any way, uh, then it creates this very self-destructive anime. And of course, Durkheim, in his book on suicide, asks the question, what is it that drives individuals and societies to carry out acts of self-annihilation? Uh, and he said it, it is wrath, in essence, uh, because all of these, you know, uh, you know, those who seek the annihilation of others are driven by these desires for self-destruction. So, um, yes, I think that, that I mean, modernity is part of the problem because it's, it's essentially, it holds up all of the values that, if you want to take the seven deadly sins, were warned against. I mean, what is everything in a corporate capitalist culture? I mean, you see it on reality television shows. What values do we celebrate as a culture? Well, it's every value that all of the great metaphysical writers have warned us lead to self-destruction. Uh, so it's about uh, the cult of the self. It's about gaining wealth, it's about gaining power, it's about uh, the, the hedonism of the narcissism of, you know, being eternally young, uh, uh, and that is just on, on every level. And when you fail, uh, and most people fail now, given the, the, you know, the seizing up or the ossification of, uh, of our democracy and this uh, massive uh, social inequality, it's always your fault. So, it, 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 this is, you know, positive psychology. It's, if something's wrong with you, nothing's wrong with the system. So that self-loathing uh, is just exponentially increased. And I think you see it expressed in mass shootings. The nihilism of people who just go in and kill uh, everyone around them irrationally. And, and, uh, and I think it comes from uh, these feelings that you know, the, the society at large is just cast you aside as human refuse. Well, again, I mean, I, I agree, and I think that's all true, um, and I, I wouldn't disagree uh, by and large, but I still feel that there's something deeper going on. I just, I feel like the loss of, of God in people's lives, the loss of even just religious practice, uh, if you look at you know, look at, give me the stories that you tell and I'll, and I'll give you your culture. I mean, look at the type films, the, the, the music that people listen to. Talk about demonic thoughts. Um, and, and just, I, people are being filled with this on a day in, day out basis. How, like, violent porn, it's just, you wrote a whole chapter. That chapter, I wish I never read. I thought you should have had. You, you should have had a trigger warning before that chapter because that chapter haunts me to this day. And, and I just, that's the type of stuff that these kids are, are uh, absorbing in a culture. And I just don't see how you could have anything but filth come out of some people. And we live in a culture that thrives off the deadly sins. We sell everything with the deadly sins. And, and in, in the past, cultures actually recognized human weakness and tried to help people overcome uh, their, their natural inclination towards that sinfulness. And I just, I don't see it. Uh, it's not, uh, we have so many films about angry people that go out and just, you know, uh, 
Man of Wrath, I think, is the latest one. Um, or Well, we celebrate, we celebrate them. That's what I mean. I mean, there's a real celebration. And so I just feel like, you know, the theology of today is demonology. It's not, it's not, it's not the study of God. It's really the study of, of demons. And that's what people absorb. And I just don't see how young people especially... Um, how they're taught, you know, the whole, like stepping on toes is a good example. You know, I didn't know about stepping on toes, although I should have, you know, Elvis had that song, Don't Step on My Blue Suede Shoes, right? And, uh, but I did not know, and I was in Atlanta, and I, I was coming out, and I was with Imam Zaid Shaker, and, uh, and I was coming out of uh, uh, the baggage claim, and I felt a little bump, you know, because I had one of those drag bags, I felt a little bump, but I didn't turn around. I just thought I hit something on the floor. And I almost got killed by this guy who thought that I did it on purpose. I mean, it was a pretty intense experience. But I think that state, there's so many people that are in that state of where their sense of dignity is, is so low as a human being. And, I, and I, I feel that at the root of that is not knowing that they are a creation, you know, that, that, that has this divine spark of life and that no matter what, I mean, if you look, uh, you know, at ang anger, uh, Ecclesiastes says that anger uh, is, is, you know, be, be, do not have the spirit of anger for it resides in the breasts of fools. And I think, you know, that's a powerful truth that what is a fool but somebody who doesn't know who they are or where they're going. I, I, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I look at, you know, where we are as the culture of death, uh, you know, in theological terms. As you know, wading into these kinds of discussions in a relentlessly secular society, especially if you come out of the left, as I do, and, you know, religious prejudice is the last acceptable prejudice in the left, uh, I have to tread very lightly because, you know, people are uh, uncomfortable now, even in this society, addressing these issues. But I think that Tillich had it right, that there are fundamental realities about human nature and human society that can only be expressed in theological or religious terms. Right. Um, uh, but no, I totally agree, uh, and uh, that is part of the rise of this kind of culture of sadism. Um, I mean, really, that's the best way to, to describe it. Uh, you know, whether it's, I mean, we're a pornified society, which, of course, as you know, I've written about, as you cited, um, uh, the, the celebration of violence. I mean, all these or a lot of these mass shooters spend a lot of time playing these video games like Call to Duty. I, I, I may have it wrong. I've never played a video game in my life, but you know these violent video games, um, which models a kind of behavior. But but the whole gun culture becomes and violence becomes a way of self empowerment or a false kind of sense of self empowerment when all the other avenues seem closed. And of course, we we fetishize weapons in this country for that reason. It's a myth, but, you know, they take away every other form of self-empowerment, but we still have our arsenal. I, my family's from Maine. I mean, I have neighbors in Maine who have, like, one of them has 23 weapons in his house. It's a false sense of empowerment, but it's, it's why the Second Amendment is so contentious, because um, take away that gun and th every sense of empowerment is, is gone. You know, it's interesting. There's, I've, I've been in societies where they, all the men have weapons, you know, just as a part of, but, but they rarely use them because they have such a profound sense of the sanctity of life. And again, I think, you know, if you grow up watching, apparently a 15-year-old a, a, a has seen about 18,000 murders uh, on, on television. And, and the way that they kill people, there, there's one of the most popular, I don't know if it is anymore, but when I read about it, and I, like you, have never played one of these games, but I did read quite a bit about them uh, d during a period. And one of the game, most popular games is, was auto theft, something auto theft. 
and they had you got points for running over old ladies with grocery baskets and they and they have one scene where the guy picks up a prostitute abuses her and then literally beats her to death with 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 a uh, with a baseball bat and and this is like a popular game that kids play and and they are kids playing these games even though they're supposedly for 18 and older they all get them you know so i i really i i feel like you know uh iceland one of my favorite countries i don't know if you know a lot about iceland but um you know iceland they brought in that notorious um anti-semite you know the chess player um and, and their view on it was anybody that can play chess that good, we're going to ignore his politics. This is Bobby Fischer. Bobby, Bobby Fischer, Fischer right? yeah. But, but they actually outlawed, it's one of the most secular societies in the world, and they outlawed pornography. You know, you can't sell pornography uh, because it, they just saw it as a very destructive force. And I think one of the things about this country is that we really fail to look at the the social sciences that, I mean, for instance, Pamela Paul, uh, who wrote that book, Pornified, and, and I actually had her at RAS, you've been there, uh, in Canada. One of the things that she found is that people that watched a lot of pornography over about a 10-year period ended up in, in pedophilic material, like it was a natural progression, or an unnatural uh, progression to uh, because the the threshold for stimulation gets higher and higher and yeah, a lot of right. a, lo a lot of them had self-loathing yeah well you know at the end of that chapter in empire of illusion on porn i end it with these people who buy these silicon silicon dolls you know right. that are these whatever they call them you know because for me porn is about necrophilia it's about death it is about the death of the soul of the other woman. Um, so you're right, and, and, and porn today doesn't bear any resemblance to porn of a few decades ago. I went to kink.com in the last book, which is, uh, they, they used to, they've sold it, but it used to be the old National Armory in San Francisco in the Mission District, and you would live, people live stream in and pay money to have women waterboarded, beaten, tortured, tied up, uh, and this isn't simulated, this is real. I really think we're in the grips of demons, and I think if we don't recognize that, we're not, we're not able to address it, because it's only a supernatural power that can get us out of this, because I think the supernatural forces that are involved are being denied by secularists. They just, they won't, they won't entertain the reality of these things. I think the other problem is that, uh, you know, within the society, which is, I think, you know, was always an understanding of early religious leaders, is that to achieve the moral or the religious life takes incredible hard work and right. self-discipline on a daily basis. On a daily basis, you know? yeah. And, and that's been lost. And that, that you, all of us have these proclivities within us. That's part of human nature. Um, you know, there's a great saying about pride. The Buddhists say, we all have thoughts like that about ourselves, but it doesn't mean we should invite them to tea. Right. And I think that's lost, that these, these forces that act in a way to destroy us and that are within us, um, and let's call them the demonic, I think that's a correct term, they're there. And if you don't work to guard against them, um, then they can, they can consume you. Uh, and and this is why all of the great metaphysical writers, I mean, this is one of my complaint with both liberal Christianity and the evangelical movement, is that these medical, metaphysical questions have largely been abandoned for, uh, you know, the, tr the trivia. I, I had a professor who I liked very much. He was talking about, you know, the whole exploration of the Gnostic Gospels. And he said, well, it's interesting, but so what? And that's right. So what? Because they're not the fundamental questions that keep us on track. And I wrote a book, actually, on the Ten Commandments. I read that book, uh, yeah. I, I wanted to call it the Decalogue, you know, you know, this primitive story, and it got before the marketing people at Simon & Schuster, none of them had heard of the Decalogue, so I they made me take it off. I relented, regretfully, and it's called Losing Moses on the Freeway. But 
but it, the, those commandments are, it's not that we don't violate them. We, we do. I mean, we're human. But they're kinds of signposts to keep us on the right road. Right. And I think that the, the great metaphysical writers of all of the great religious traditions were attempting to keep us on the right road. And now we don't even know how to ask the question because uh, even within liberal Christianity, metaphysical questions are, uh, you know, have been largely uh, sidelined or forgotten for this constant obsession over the figure of Jesus, right? Um, which isn't really important to me at all. Right. Uh, I mean, I come out of the church tradition, but it's not important. The whole study of metaphysics has, has been really removed. I mean, I think in, in the United States, the Dominicans might be the only people that are really doing deep dives still into, in, into the, the, the whole apparatus that one needed to know in order to study metaphysics. Um, yeah. Logic is very important, and, and that alone, material logic, takes a long time. I mean, I've tried to penetrate um, John of, uh, of uh, St. Thomas. You know, it's, it's very difficult stuff, and it traditionally took a lot of hefty study. I mean, I, the few metaphysicians that I know that are really, really steeped in it have spent their life in it, but according to, uh, and, and I think this is absolutely true, according to all of our traditions, metaphysics was the architectonic um, uh, knowledge that was needed to navigate everything else because it goes to first principles and that's why I, I feel so much in our you know Thoreau said that for everybody that's that's uh, uh, for, 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 for every one person that's hacking away at the roots of a problem there are thousands hacking away at the, at the bushes you know, that going to the root is, is where metaphysics really comes in. And that's where I feel like even anger in our culture, I just don't, first of all, I truly believe that the modern world in, in many ways is so unnatural, the way people are living, uh, that it's causing a lot of, uh, one of the, it's causing a lot of trouble. And one of the, uh, I think it was St. John uh, Climacus, who, who he, he had perturbation, per Perturbatio was, was his translation uh, for, you know, what happens in the soul. Uh, that, uh, you know, these perturbations, you know, this, these disruptions. In, in our traditions, they're called iltirabat, where people are so unsettled in their being. And, and, and the modern world is doing this to a lot of people. The, the, the pace of life, uh, getting on the road, uh, I mean, road rage is a very interesting phenomenon, you know, but, but uh, when, you, when you have these people that are in these states of anger, it's, it's quite understandable why these things would happen. Well, you know, I spent almost 20 years in war, so I watched what wrath does right. and how it begins with the dehumanization of the other, of course, right. but it rapidly becomes you dehumanize yourself. And there is an intoxicating quality about violence. I've seen it. Sure. Um, but you don't walk away from that uh, without deep scars. And that life of violence or life of wrath uh, is often unbearable. So you that's why suicides are so high uh, among combat veterans in the United States. And those are the suicides we count. There's all sorts of the other suicides through alcoholism or opioid addiction. Uh, uh, and in that sense, you're right, that those demonic uh, forces or look at avarice or you know, greed uh, you know, in the end, what happens, and I, and I went to boarding school when I was 10 as a scholarship student with the uber rich. I mean, these weren't just the upper middle. These were the richest people in the country. And uh, their interior life was so deeply impoverished uh, and sad. Um, and, and they end their lives now as I get older. I watch my classmates who never had to work a day in their life. Uh, I mean, Marx got it right. They lived lives as parasites. 
Um, but they surround themselves with people who, who tell them what, the, who flatter them and tell them what, but secretly despise them, internally can't stand them. They're utterly friendless. Uh, and I think that, you know, why I, that's why I like your idea of doing the seven deadly sins, or I think the seven thoughts are probably better. Evil thoughts, I think uh, Igrius called them. Um, but it's right, because um, they, they will consume you until there's nothing left. And the only uh, bulwark against it uh, is to actively recognize our own capacity for self-destruction or even evil. This is why I think both of us like Primo Levi so much and then fight against it. It's that knowledge of our own capacity for evil. And then the, the understanding that it's almost a daily battle to push against us, against it, that saves us from being consumed by it. And I'm often criticized for being very dark as a writer, coming, but coming out of places like Sarajevo or El Salvador, you know, I've, I've seen the worst of human atrocity. But I think right. that it, it's, it, it is that knowledge that the line between the victim and the victimizer is razor thin. Um, and when you understand that, then it's, you, you have a, a, a more of an ability to guard against it so that you don't cross it. It's when you're not self-reflective, when you externalize evil. Uh, and you don't understand, you know, the evil that we all carry within us, um, that you, it's far, you can, you can succumb. It, it's far easier to succumb to evil itself. You know, I see you as playing an incredibly important uh, role. It's a painful one to have to play, but um, I, there's, there's an interesting, James Thurber, you know, the uh, humorist, he, uh, he met with uh, Van Doren, Mark Van Doren, on his on his uh, farm up in in Vermont, and uh, and he, he was telling him how he was going blind, and and he was telling him he thought that God was punishing him, and, and he said, why would you think that? He said, because I've spent my life making fun of people, and uh, and Van Doren said, you know, I I would see it absolutely as the opposite. You've done a great social service by pointing out the foibles of people so that we can laugh at ourselves, which is very important. And uh, Thurber later said that he actually saved his life because he was contemplating oh. suicide. Um, it's, it's one of those, the gift of consolation. So I see, I see your dark side as the opposite, like, you know, where Thurber was using humor to point out something really important for all of us to see. I see your, you know, you're doing something also incredibly important because we, I think we forget, you know, our parents lived through uh, Nazi Germany, you know. It's hard to believe it wasn't that long ago. I mean, I have my friend, Dr. Eva Brand, uh, who, uh, you know, she, she, she was, told me stories. I mean, she's alive in Annapolis, God give her a long life. But she told me stories of these Nazi youth terrorizing her on the way to school. It just wasn't that long ago. And I think people forget that. And you've seen that. You saw it happen in Sarajevo. I mean, these are much smaller examples of the same phenomenon where, where people are dehumanized and then, and then anger is literally, it's cultivated in the hearts of people. Like there's a sowing of the seeds of wrath and, and then they're nurtured over time. And then when they burst out, everybody's shocked. But it's that creeping villainy that uh, Kierkegaard talks about, of not seeing it. I think one of the things in Matthew, um, I, it's in the fifth chapter, you know, Math, uh, Christ talks about that you've heard it said of old, thou shall not kill, and if you murder, then you'll, you'll be liable to judgment. But I say, right, is a whole other standard. I say that if you have anger with unjust cause towards your brother, you stand condemned. And if you say raka, which is interesting is the Arabic word as well, you know, like flimsy or foolish. And then he said, uh, you know, then, then you stand in judgment. And so he, I, again, he, I felt like he's getting to the root of the problem because the murder started much earlier with the seeds 
of calling somebody raka, you know, dehumanizing. It it's, gets to exactly what you were just saying. Um, it, I think it's a profound psychological insight into where this all comes from. Well, people are conditioned to kill. So you, you see it, you know, I spent seven years in the Middle East and went into Kuwait in the first Gulf War, the first battalion, first Marines, but the way that they referred to the people who lived in countries like Iraq were uh, invariably derogatory, racial slur or ethnic slurs. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that one of the problems in, you see it in Gaza as well, anytime uh, you, you, you have a foreign occupation of another people, uh, this is true in Iraq, true in Afghanistan, uh, your enemy, Robert J. Lifton writes about this in terms of Vietnam, but you, anytime you leave the perimeter, the, which is this tiny base of security, and even then that can be mortared, uh, everyone is the enemy. And your enemy is elusive in asymmetrical warfare. So it's an IED, it's an ambush, and they melt away. And you start losing uh, members of your own unit. But there's almost no enemy to strike back against. And so you have this atrocity-producing situation, Lifton calls it, where... Uh, everybody becomes uh, a, a legitimate target. Uh, and, and I think that the other thing I found about war is that, and I, I, like anyone who spent a lot of time in war, I struggle with PTSD, but I also know a lot of veterans. And I think the worst uh, is not just the PTSD, it's something I don't have, thankfully, but it is this moral injury, it's what they did. When you really probe deeply, it's about the children they killed. Uh, it, you know, it's because these weapons are not discriminate. Uh, once you start firing a belt-fed saw, I don't know what the rounds are per minute, 600 or something. There are a lot. There's no discrimination at all. Right. Um, and I'm not sure you ever recover from that, um, or, or it's certainly very hard to recover. You can with, with a deep spiritual well that you can draw from. And, and just to give you an example, I literally read yesterday, um, have you ever read Megan's essay on uh, Heracles? No, on Heracles? Yeah, no. on, on Euripides' no. play. He actually quotes you in it. It's, it's a great, no. I used to have the, in my freshman seminar, I'd have them read that play, which is really about PTSD. I mean, that's his yeah. argument because he comes back from the war and, and kills his whole family in this kind yeah. of, uh, and, and, and wakes up to find this horror. But, um, you know, Megan talks about all the veterans watching this play, you know, and what that must have been for them. Um, but, and, and you've talked about, you know, the odyssey, the 10 year journey back after yeah. the war to your family. But he quotes you in there talking about, you know, the bond that men have this profound bond uh, in war that, that takes place that really uh, culminates in a kind of love that they have for one another. But then he follows that up by talking about what can happen when the enemy, that actually takes place with the enemy. And there's a very interesting, I don't know if you saw the film, The Mauritanian, but um, this young man, he's a Mauritanian, uh, Mohamedou Salahi. Uh, I, I was just literally on uh, uh, a Zoom call with him and David Wood, who was his guard at Guantanamo, and they've become best friends. And, and it, was the, it was the profound spirituality of this Mauritanian that transformed uh, this guard in experiencing despite the fact that he knew what was happening and it was horrible, but he just, he just saw the humanity, but also the deep spirituality of this person, and it really had a massive impact on his heart. And uh, so they, they became very close, and I think that's, to me, the, the optimism, if I can say that, or rather the hope, a better word, uh, that, that we can overcome these things. I think it's possible. I just was talking to this uh, amazing man from Southern California, um, Tobias, who he was several years incarcerated for a murder he didn't commit. You know, I mean, in prison, not, you know, every, most people admit why, why, why they're there. You know, they, 
but there are innocent people that do end up there. And, uh, and he was genuinely innocent, but he had no, he took this kind of stoic approach to being in prison and he was able to transform all of these inmates with his attitude and his approach, it, because he took a kind of, I don't know if you read, ever read Boethius, but it was a kind of uh, an approach that somebody like Boethius would take. And I know somebody also like that, Imam Abu Qadir Al-Amin, who's an amazing Imam that was on death row in San Quentin. And uh, he was on death row for several years. And he never let it get to him. And it was because of his spiritual well that he was able to draw from. And I think for me, that's what's been lost in our civilization and our culture. And I think that's at the root of so much anger because anger, as you know, the root of that angst is a sorrow, right? And, and yeah. we, we know Imam al-Ghazali says there's a relationship between anger and sorrow. He says anger will come out with a, a, somebody who has the power to take his retribution. But if they're powerless, they become sorrowful. So it's the same source. It's really the same emotion. And he was able to transform that into something really positive. And now he, he actually became a, an advisor to the California penal system. Uh, and the governor, he got, he got a pardon, but um, the, the, the warden at San Quentin said in all his years in, in uh, the criminal justice system, he'd never seen a human being transformed like that man. Solzhenitsyn writes about this in the Gulag Archipelago. So the two groups that manage to endure, maybe they don't endure as distinct individuals, but to endure spiritually are the Chechens, and the Christians. Those people who remain rooted in a deep religious tradition are able to psychologically endure in a way that uh, the political prisoners often cannot. Well, what happened with uh, Muhammadu, the, the man next door to him, that they ended up committing suicide? He couldn't take it. Whereas Muhammadu, he, despite that, he went through torture, he went through waterboarding, and this is over a period of years. I mean, it's pretty horrific um, what happened to him, but he, you know, he has an amazing spirit, and I know where it comes from because I lived with those people for over 10 years, and, and there, you know, he's, he memorized the whole Quran, so he had access to this spiritual well that he could drink from in the worst of conditions, and I, I just feel if we don't restore that place of, of uh, you know, of, of the theocentricity and the importance of it in a culture, uh, however you want to call it, I just, I don't see any way out of this morass that... No, that's right. Then, then you're extinguished. I remember I, I knew, I used to work in Gaza and I wanted to go spend uh, several days in the refugee camp of Hani Yunus which at the time was controlled uh, by Hamas, and I knew the head of Hamas, Rantisi, and I told him I was going. And so he called ahead and said, you know, leave him alone, he's all right. But I remember going through the refugee camp. Now remember, in, in Gaza, you, you, you're living ten to a room, there's no work, there's nothing really there by which you have that you can actualize yourself within the society other than your faith. And it was then that I understood the importance of praying five times a day. Because everything up in their life had no structure, but that gave them structure. Amazing. And I could, well, I don't know how it is today, but I could walk through that refugee camp, which I did, at one or two in the morning, and I was perfectly safe. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, yes, I think that, uh, you know, there is, there are deep, psychological and spiritual reasons uh, people in every culture have uh, formulated religious systems uh, to essentially give them structure and meaning and, the, and the, with the rise of a secular culture uh, we have allowed the demonic to essentially seize complete and total control and what's so frightening is that we don't even know it's demonic. I'm, I'm, I totally agree. The Palestinians are an amazing example of people that do have a well to draw from, both the Christian and the Muslim, uh, in, in those horrific conditions. Um, one of the things, and, and I'd like, as we're coming to a close here, uh, one of the things that 
for me, uh, the, 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 the virtue that the countervailing virtue that uh, really is able to constrain anger is forbearance and patience. And, and, uh, and, and that goes under the moral virtue of courage. So it's very interesting that courage is, is what counters anger. It's not courageous to get angry. It's actually courageous to be able to suppress your anger. And our prophet, peace be upon him, said that it's the, the wrestler who can throw a man is not the strong man. The strong man is the one that can suppress his anger. And there are so many verses, one of the most uh, reiterated virtues in the Quran is patience. And it seems to me that this age is an age that really demands that spiritual practice, uh, the virtue of courage, and from that the daughters of courage, uh, of which include patience and forbearance. And, and, and just the idea of being able to, to bear other people. I mean, God gave us families for, in order for us to teach teach that fundamental truth that we need to bear other people because we don't choose our families. And very often, I don't think there's any family that's not immune to the uncle or somebody they don't want brought to the dinner table. But they come anyway because home is the place where if you have to go there, they have to take you in, as Frost reminds us. So I, I feel like if we don't restore the, the place of virtue ethics uh, in our culture, I just I don't see any solutions to this problem. Well, we also diminish, or or we don't understand the power of the moral life. Uh, Vasily Grossman, I think, writes about this beautifully in Life and Fate. the The power of kindness, he calls it, simple human kindness. And I saw that in Eastern Europe in the revolutions that I covered where these figures like Václav Havel, I was every night in the Magic Lantern Theater with Havel, uh, he'd been a non-person from since Charter 77, since 1977 until 1989, and yet his steadfastness to that moral imperative, to what he called living in truth, gave him an authority that brought down the communist regime of Czechoslovakia. And I, you know, I, I was in Venceslas Square, it was cold and snowy, for all of those demonstrations, half a million people, and the great uh, uh, Czech uh, singer, uh, Marta Kubasheva, who had sung a prayer for Marta, which was the anthem of defiance in 68, when the Soviet tanks rolled in and overthrew Dubček. So after the Soviets took control and put in a puppet regime, uh, her she was banned from the airwaves, a recording stock was destroyed, uh, she worked on an assembly line in a toy factory, and I was there when she walked out on that balcony, 500,000 Czechs. She begins to sing a prayer for Marta, and every Czech in the crowd knew every word. And most of them hadn't even been born. Yeah. In the, and, and that is the power, Mandela had it on, on Robben Island, you know, that forbearance, that patience. And essentially, you know, there were large numbers of guards, apartheid regime guards, who were struck down by that moral force. And this, again, I, I know you admire Solzhenitsyn as I do. This is a constant theme of Solzhenitsyn. And I think that uh, in a secular society, we've done many things wrong. Uh, and one of the worst is that we don't understand the power of love. And, and that that power is one that can vanquish evil if we have the courage to practice it. That's what Tobias was teaching, what he called bold love, uh, which is, is really that kind of loving somebody who's really not worthy of your love. And, and one of the interesting things about anger, in the table of the seven deadly sins of Hieronymus Bosch, you know, he has, yeah, he, yeah. He has the two, one, one's got a table on his head, I think, and the other one's brandishing a sword. But it's the woman who's holding him back. And, and I think, you know, there's something very profound in that, uh, in that image that it is love 
that can overcome that. Hate cannot overcome hate. Uh, and, that, and that was, I think, Dr. King's, uh, you know, the power that he had of, uh, of love. And, and um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Beya also, that's something that he definitely, he emanates that and, and people can feel it around him uh, because it, it's something that uh, the spiritual power of it and not a kind of, you know, agape, right? It's, it's that deep uh, spiritual love um, that, uh, that we need more of. And I think that's the only thing that can really diffuse a lot of these things. It doesn't always work, unfortunately, with some people, but there are people that are completely disarmed by it. I mean, there are, we, you know, our tradition distinguishes between uh, spirit demons and human demons. And the Prophet Muhammad said that human demons were much worse because they, they, ha they, ha they can actually, they have a type of volition and agency in the world that the spiritual demons don't. The spiritual demons can only suggest, whereas the human demons actually can impose their will uh, on the material world. You know, I, we could go on and I, I'm always, I always marvel at what you've done and where you've been and, and the power that you can bring into a conversation because of that experience. And I've seen you do this many times. It's very disarming uh, because so many people have, have not seen what you've seen or been through what you've been through. Um, and I think the Palestinian, you know, the testimony that you've given to the Palestinian people has just been so powerful over the years because, you know, despite the fact of, unfortunately, the leadership is, is in, all, in all cases, everywhere, is wanting deeply. But uh, the people, as you know, are just, they're just extraordinary people and uh, just have a beautiful culture. We, we're, we're people of hope and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the great theological virtues that uh, our, our faith share. A lot of people don't know that you are a minister. I hide it, Hansa. <laughs> I know. You know, unfortunately, um, my experience, because I went to Catholic schools, I was like you. I was from a very poor, my immediate family was very poor, but I, I came from an a extended family that had a lot of wealth. But my mother was a working class mother, and, uh, and I, I had an opportunity to go to a prep school, so I went to school with the rich kids. And I agree with you, I was, I was laughing about you saying that they, they're surrounded by these psychophants who don't realize, yeah. you know, and Dylan has that great line, you never turned around to see the frowns on the jugglers and the <laughs> clowns that all did tricks for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now there, it's, there's a tremendous wisdom to them. You know, I, I, I go back to them and I, and I really do feel um, that yeah, they, they, they're they definitely uh, a wisdom. Uh, even the six poisons in Buddhism has four of the seven. So I think they're, and pride is always, you know, traditionally yeah. they saw pride as really at the root because I think anger, a lot of anger comes from pride. Um, one of the things that uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, that if somebody gets angry, that he should, um, if he's standing, he should sit down. And if he's still difficulty in one narration he says let him put his cheek on the earth wow. and and imam al-ghazali commenting on that in in his book called the 40 al Arba'in, he says because it's arrogance that makes us angry and and he said that putting your cheek on the ground is to remind yourself that you are humus you are of the earth and, and, and you should be like the earth. Everybody stomps on her, and yet all wow, she gives great. is goodness. Yeah, that's great. God bless, Chris. All right, it was great to see you. Take care.